At the heart of what we do is exploring limitless possibilities to enrich lives all over the world. Life is precious and we are in the business of cherishing every precious heartbeat. Every day brings a new reason to better our lives. Something to learn. Something to laugh and enjoy. Something to dream. For as long as there's a dream, there's hope. And as long as there's hope, there's joy in living. Reasons for us to keep every heart happy and healthy. Helping us in our endeavor are the many interventional cardiovascular solutions that we create. At our state-of-the-art facilities, we make our stents and catheters. Wires and needles. German excellence and Indian innovation backed by credible research. With the unmatched advantage of being the only company with clinical trials data spanning over 10 years for efficacy and safety. And a one of its kind partnership with the German Heart Center, renowned for its pioneering advancements in cardiovascular technologies. It's not surprising we have over 5,000 satisfied clients and a million smiling patients in over 50 countries around the world. We trust good things happen when you follow your heart because there's an ocean of opportunities to discover. And our journey has just begun. Translumina, exploring limitless possibilities of life. All right, thank you for watching. Uh, Ajay, over to you now. Thank you, Sheil. I'm sharing my slide deck. Yes, it's visible. Just make it full screen. Yeah. Perfect. So I am doing the company introduction. Uh, firstly, welcome everyone for uh, to the Conquering the Complex uh, series of uh, webinars. Uh, uh, we are today having a session on exploring new horizons on uh, in complex PCI management uh, with uh, great speakers and panel. Uh, I welcome everyone. And uh, now we go through a quick company overview. Uh, Translumina was incorporated in year 2000 in Germany uh, and as a global interventional cardiovascular device company with an ambition to deliver world-class products and services. We have fully integrated product development and manufacturing facilities in Germany and in India. Currently, we commercialize our products over 50 countries globally and we are expanding uh, our presence in the rest part of the world. Uh, our current pro pro product portfolio include uh, CE mark products, mainly uh, Yukon Choice PC and Yukon Chrome PC. These two products are made in Germany. We also have Yukon Choice Flex and Vivo Isar. Uh, Vivo Isar is our latest product edition uh, that is made in India. Uh, we have both biodegradable stent platform as well as uh, polymer free stent platform Vivo Isar available with us. Uh, our techno stent technology has thin strut, abluminal coating, and uh, and strong clinical backup with our, with our technology. Besides that, we also have bare metal stand platform Yukon CC and our semi-compliant balloons, Cathy number four. We have strategic partnership on, in specific markets, countries uh, with companies like QX Medical and DISA balloons. We also have SIS Medical, Shockwave, Abiomed, and Asahi partnership for Indian markets. And we are working on other strategic partnerships so that we expand our presence and product portfolio. Our new product pipeline uh, in 2023, we are planning to introduce SC and NC balloons and CTO balloon catheters. We are also planning to introduce vascular accessories in, into the international markets. We currently have uh, vascular accessories for Indian market. 
uh, as you might have heard that we are putting up a new uh, transcatheter aortic valve structural heart disease manufacturing facility in south of india and that is our future pipeline to a uh, couple of years from now we intend to launch our uh, structural heart portfolio and we are also working on drug coated balloon portfolio uh, translumina has been uh, involved in best in class clinical and educational programs such as today's program uh, through scientific collaboration with various academic groups like uh, german art center and yourself and now going to the uh, briefly about the uh, the products uh, yukon choice uh, has been a, a product that we have with biodegradable polymer with several publications in uh, uh, world renowned journals like circulation and uh, european society of cardiology has uh, given us approval for our yukon choice tents vivo isar is our polymer free technology uh, we, for which also we have 10 years published data in various uh, high impact journals like jack and uh, interventional cardiology and uh, other journals both uh, our biodegradable polymer and uh, polymer free technologies have proven uh, safety and efficacy records thank you very much here i introduce professor uh, lijo vargis uh, he is a interventional cardiologist from kovai medical center coimbatore tamil nadu india and i request you to take over as a moderator for the sessions thank you thank you uh, ajay for the uh, introduction thing without much of a delay we'll go on to the program before that i would just like to introduce the uh, chairperson and welcome them uh, our chairperson is dr carlo gregori is the chief uh, interventional cardiologist in uh, from italy he has multiple uh, close to 150 studies published in his name in mostly international journals also we have expert panel for uh, four people dr faisal mehman is a expert cardiologist with 17 years of experience from pakistan Dr. Devrata Dash is from uh, Dubai, uh, Astor Hospital. He also has huge number of interventions to his name. Dr. Shamim Siddiqui is a consultant cardiologist and full-time faculty at Karachi, Pakistan, uh, with again in, uh, lots of interest in complex coronary interventions. Dr. Hamad Hamdi is a cardiologist from uh, University in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, uh, and he has also done a lot of complex procedures. um so this is the expert panel and i think we have uh, six speakers uh, uh today and each of them have been given a time of 10 minutes i uh, i see that we have a uh, discussion at the end of all the talks right around 20 minutes uh shil there's one problem like the one speakers may not be there throughout uh, initial speaker may log off so is it possible to just have a 3 to 4 minute discussion at the end of sure. each uh, talk Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think because like uh, the first speaker requested that he may go off, so it's might might as well have it at the end of each talk. Uh, sure. Before starting, uh, our chairperson, Dr. Carlo, any comments from your side? Yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure for me to participate in this meeting. Uh, thanks, Alunia, for the invitation. I'm very excited to uh, to to learn about your cases with this uh, device. Right, so I think we'll go on to the first uh, speaker, Dr. Pierre Coder. He's an associate practitioner and from uh, France. Over to you, sir. You can share your case. Okay. One moment, so I'll share screen. do you do you see my yes sir yes okay. uh first of all thank you so much for this invitation i'm pierre coder cardiologist in tarp south of france uh i chose this case uh, because it, it never happened to me i would love to see the uh, more experimented cardiologist opinion on on how to act in this situation uh so i'll start by presenting my case it, uh, i was on call it was an 89 year old lady with a really good general status no uh, cognitive problems she has a history of um, ischemic heart disease with a proximal led stent in 2016 uh, it was in another uh, hospital so i didn't have really the 
uh, the, the choreography, the, the, the film. Uh, she has a history also of uh, aortic uh, aneurysm <clears throat> uh, operated, uh, restrictive lung disease with home oxygen requirement, but very minimal. And she walks and she, she does all her daily stuff. Uh, she's obese, hypertensive, dyslipidemic, and she was already on aspirin as a treatment among other uh, anti-hypertensive drugs. The patient presented um, the 12 hours before presentation to the ER, chest pain, uh, left arm chest, uh, and left arm, sorry, pain. Uh, she was brought to the ER by the family uh, the next morning, so it was 12 hours after the pain, for mainly the acute respiratory distress. Uh, so upon arriving to the ER, she had a 70% uh, saturation uh, oxygen. And on the EKG, we had uh, an ST elevation MI in the inferior leads with sinus bradycardia. She was like around 38, 40 uh, 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 heart rate. So at first, uh, the, the, uh, the emergency uh, doctor put her on non-invasive ventilation and with uh, a bolus of Lasix, and she, she, she went really much better on uh, respiratory wise. And uh, we loaded her with aspirin and uh, ticagrelor and uh, non-fractionated heparin. And once the, she was able to lay, lay down on the uh, flat, we transferred her to the cath lab. Uh, I attempted the first in, in France, we do a lot of radial uh, access. So we, we did uh, firstly the right radial uh, access. I wasn't able to, to look up on the right uh, coronary artery uh, through the right and the left radial. So I went through the uh, right femoral axis through six French at the end. She was a bit agitated during the exam. So we, we, were, we were obliged to do some of the midazolam to calm her down. So I'll start with the the video so we can see uh, here with the circumflex and the uh, margin artery was, was patent we can see here the stent the lad looks not that bad with a small rich stenosis and a small diagonal and with an occlusion of the proximal right coronary artery. So, so, I, I, uh, so here I switched to the uh, femoral axis. I, uh, it was a GR uh, a six French uh, uh, catheter and I used the BMW guide wire. The, the, uh, uh, the wire passed really easily. I didn't have any uh, re resistance uh, at first. And we, we can see the, the flow uh, passing by easily directly after the, the guide wire passing. And uh, I ballooned with a semi-compliant balloon uh, cap cross. Uh, it was 2.0 times 15. I ballooned many, many times. And uh, I stented with a Yukon um, Chrome stent 2.5 times 40 millimeters. The, it was really easy. I didn't have any resistance uh, passing the, the stent. And as we can see here, after the impaction of the stent, when it was really easy. Uh, meanwhile, the, the, the patient was a bit agitated and she was, uh, she was a bit desaturating. So we were trying to finish. So I didn't post dilate with a non-complying balloon. While uh, I, I wanted to really finish easily, uh, quickly, sorry, because she was really, uh, she had 85% saturation. And uh, so we wanted to, to, uh, to, to stabilize the respiratory wise, especially we have a good flow. So when I was uh, uh, withdrawing the guide wire, I felt really a, a great resistance. I've never felt that. So uh, we can see the tip of the of the guide wire in the ostium of the right coronary artery. So first in mind, I I thought to put another guide wire and to try to block it with a with a balloon and withdraw it or impact it in the coronary artery. Honestly, it never happened to me. So uh, while doing another incidence, we can see now the tip of this guide wire, like here in the aorta. So honestly, it was too small to try to take it off with a lasso or a rope 
or to do something uh, any other uh, uh, so honestly uh, on the table I, I didn't think of anything else that I can do so uh, uh, I finished the procedure I put in, in place an angio seal and we said we will try to stabilize the patient and we'll control to see if there's any uh, complication uh, otherwise uh, she was stabilized with non-invasive ventilation with no need of intub intubation we controlled the uh, echography uh, right after there was no signs of complications with mild inferior hypokinesia. Uh, she developed small subcutaneous hematoma without active bleeding, uh, with only two units of blood transfusion, and hemoglobin was stable upon discharge, with also uh, acute kidney uh, failure stabilized upon discharge. During uh, almost five or six days of hospitalization, there was no signs of systemic embolization, either cerebral or peripheral. And uh, I saw the patient one one month after discharge, and she is really doing well. Honestly, what what was a bit shocking to me it was the the how could have happened. We have I had only one guide. The procedure was smooth. There was no bifurcation. There was no uh, double stenting or other. So I didn't really understand the how could have happened. Uh, the other question for the uh, more experimented colleagues instead, uh, in this case, what, what could we do if the, this tip of the guide remained in the right coronary artery? Shall we restand to block this tip or balloon or try to uh, balloon and take out this tip of the, of the guide? Uh, so uh, uh, thank you. And I'm really... Uh, uh, I really want to know what, what do the colleague would do in this case and uh, in, in other scenarios, maybe if, if the tip of the, the of this guide wire would, would have remained uh, blocked in the right coronary artery. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. I Just to clarify, do, when the guide wire uh, uh, had a fracture during retrieval, Whenever. No, it was, in fact, it was, it was at the end when I was, uh, uh, because yeah. the patient was, was desaturated, so we wanted to, to, to end the procedures so while taking out the guide wire. It was really at the last step, it was but, after uh, I, I did. Did, did, did you feel the resistance? During yes, the yes, yes. There was, there was big resistance. So, I didn't uh, I have, have in mind. I have one uh, uh, Suggestion: uh, It may happen during PCI, especially in bifurcation lesion or in case of long stent. Uh, if you have a guide okay. wire in traffic, uh, it's a, a common uh, maneuver uh, before before retrieval to advance a small balloon through the guide wire and okay. uh, advance as much as possible and try to retrieve the guide wire inside the balloon. This may help to retrieve the guide okay. wire and prevent fra a fracture inside the coronary artery. I don't understand okay. why you have, uh, this happened in your case, because uh, this is not uh, a bifurcation. Uh, there is no, maybe it was uh, interpreted distally, because I saw the, the radiopaic part of the guide wire, um, which is a little bit um, uh, distorted. Uh, distorted, maybe. This time there is some entrapment, so you retrieve uh, and uh, without a protection with a, a small catheter or balloon, there was a trap. Okay. So my suggestion, okay. it, this may happen, but with a, a small balloon, you may prevent the rupture inside the coronary. And in case it, it happened and we have this tip that remains blocked here in the entry of the stent, Ground yeah. Uh, so, in, in case the the tip remained blocked here, shall we try to balloon and remove it inside the catheter on withdrawing the balloon, or impact it inside the coronary? The yeah, problem, I, so I, you know I, the I, distal I, end, right? Where the yeah. how long of the wire is inside? 
Yeah, I had a case like that. I did uh, an intravascular ultrasound in order to be sure where actually the jaguar is, because he may okay. be also already uh, still in the in the coronary. I don't see actually from the computer that maybe some part of jaguar inside the coronary or maybe completely outside in the aorta. I don't know. So to be sure mm. about the coronary, uh, you need the imaging. Okay. Uh, okay. If you are sure that the, the, it's not in the coronary, you may try to retrieve from the aorta with the gooseneck or something like that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I feel it's a little uh, strange as to why this happened because we've seen this happen. Exactly. When you use a wire under a stent or a bifurcation. Yeah. Those yeah. scenarios it can happen, especially with uh, you know old wires. This is a single exactly. wire, single stent, single yeah, guide, exactly. new wire exactly. scion. I can't explain why it happened. Only thing is, like exactly. uh, the chairperson said, when you have a lot of distal, you know, coiling, it's worthwhile taking a balloon and trying to opening it up. Once I remember, okay. I had a case in which you had a wire knuckle which was a distally. At the end of the procedure, I was trying to pull back. The knuckle actually mm. caught the distal edge of the stent, and the stent actually got pulled back, a deployed stent. Oh, okay. So, so it's always little when you have a loop, big loop distally, it's better to take a balloon down and try opening it up. But your okay. case, I mean, it's a little uh, weird as to why it happened. Uh, and regarding okay, the part that exactly. is projecting out, if you can retrieve, it's too small. It's too difficult to snare it out. It's really difficult. It's, exactly. It depends on a lot of luck to snare that out. But I suppose leave it and watch for com any complication that may develop. That's it. Yeah. I think we can yeah. have one yeah. comment from the panelists, expert panel. Anyone? If the wire, again, it is strange to happen like this. Uh, I'm surprised. Uh, I think while pulling it out, maybe it might have been forcefully pulled out and then probably, you know, over rotation or something, then it might have got entrapped. Uh, mm -hmm. With this uh, scenario, like if the wire was in coronary completely, uh, probably I would have crushed it with a stand. Okay, okay. Thank you. Right, I think we'll go on to the next case. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pierre. Okay. Uh, next, Thank we have you. Dr. Juan Faisal, who's an uh, interventional cardiologist at Kera Medical Center, Malaysia. Uh, over to you, sir, for your case. Well, good day, everyone. Uh, let me share my slide. Okay, uh, can you guys see in full screen? Uh, yes, Dr. Yes. Wan. Yes. Uh, before you begin, uh, Dr. Wan, just a humble request to the entire faculty. Please keep yourself on mute while the other okay. speakers are presenting, just to avoid any sort of noise disturbances. Thank you. Uh, yes, over to you, Mr. Uh, Dr. Wan. Please go on. Okay. Uh, thanks again for the invitation. So my title of a case is uh, nothing simple uh, when you have uh, limitations. Uh. So I'm from a small state in uh, Malaysia, which is in Kedah. So uh, this case, uh, like uh, the previous case, came during my own call. So it was a 53 years old guy, uh, which is a non-smoker with background hypertension. Unfortunately, he had, he had only the symptom for the past week, but only on the morning of the admission day he lost consciousness with chest pain and vomiting. So initially the ECG just showed subtle ST depression uh, in the inferior lids uh, with some tall R in the lid P2, P3. The initial toponym was about 1000. In my place, we used toponym I, but it quickly jumped to 116,000 the following day. So clearly it was a case of uh, non STEMI. So yeah, the following day, uh, because he came late the night before, so I planned for a semi-urgent angiogram the following day. So I just want to share you the initial diagnostic senior angiogram, the patient. I think it's very clear that you can see a very tight uh, proximal circumflex disease uh, with a disease also in the mid and the OM branch. You can see from the spider view on the right, there's probably a heavily diseased uh, LED uh, as well. So we change to another view and uh, here we can see the LED itself. Apologies, is probably you can see there was a small bubble accidentally injected 
on your left uh, senior angiogram. But what the bubble shows also is the path of the totally occluded diagonal. So the collateral from the diagonal is coming from the apex as well. And uh, on the right hand side, it's just similar from the RAO cranial view. So you have another disease uh, in the mid LED as well, which is quite long. The RC itself is uh, have a, a evidence of a vessel ectatic, especially you look at the distal segment. It's almost as large as the proximal segment, but very obviously in the mid to distal, you can very, see a very tight lesion there with a disease segment just after that tight stenosis. So basically, you are dealing with uh, uh, three vessel disease with multiple segments of positive remodeling. So you got the LED was severe in the mid, circumflex which is tight in the proximal, and also I say which is tight in the somewhere in the mid to distal segment. So at this point of time, it's uh, very difficult to say which was the carpal lesion uh, because I think almost all the vessel could have been carpet judging by the inferior and the, the lateral changes. So then again, we still have to decide on what to do. So this patient having three vessel disease, uh, we, I usually discuss with the patient what is the mode of revascularization on table. So a quick scoring shows that the syntax two score is about 22 versus CABG of 16.6. .6. Nevertheless, it's quite a low uh, to moderate syntax score. So team recommendation C allows for either PCI or CABG. And I discussed with the patients and the patient's wife, they were keen for multi-vessel PCI. But I've informed them there are caveats, there are limitations in my setting. At that moment of time, I don't have IVERS available on table. Some of, because it's a small center, some sense sizes are limited. And for cost-wise, because uh, the patient uh, requested for uh, limitation in terms of cost, I have to use one PD dilatation balloon if possible. So this is the request from the patient side. So the thinking of the strategy is that, first of all, I, I was thinking probably the RC is uh, one of the earlier carpet. Again, it could have been the circumflex, but I, I think the RC could have contributed towards the non stemmy So you can see here uh, in the red, this is definitely the aneurysm distance segment. But you have to agree, I think, before the aneurysm, there is definite disease, but only the culprit so-called lesion is that tight segment. So my plan was to just tackle the tightest part because if I want to have a stand, it will be a long stand just to cover from normal all the way to that uh, aneurysm part. But then again, I guess this is open to discussion. So this will be my plan number one for the RCE. For the second flag itself, it represents a quite a big option. It can be either from normal all the way to the normal segment, or you can probably just cover the proximal to the mid before that OM uh, branch disease. Or another option could be like the RC, you just tackle the proximal disease alone. At this point in time, I haven't decided on the final plan yet because my radiographer gave me an RO quarter view. So I wasn't satisfied. I think it's okay to decide uh, what plan when you have a decent angiography views, which additional ones can provide you further information. So I did not conclude my final plan yet. For the LED, I think LED is much more straightforward. We just cover from normal to normal with one long stand. So how did I complete the procedure? So I did use a scoring balloon, which is a score flex NC, 3.0 times 15 millimeter, dilated to just nominal pressures at that side. As you can see, this is the result after ballooning. And you, I'm just having a marker uh, from where my balloon starts and where my balloon finishes. So I thought we can probably use a very short stand just to cover that part. There are some movements in the catheter, but I plan to tackle it later by deep sitting the guide. So I use a Yukon comb 3.5 times 18 millimeter. As you can see, my guide is more into the RC as before. And this is the result after deployment of the stand. I post with 3.5 times 10, 10 millimeter. 
I think the vessel is big enough to tolerate high pressures. So I use up to 20 atmospheres. And this is the snapshot of the results. And this is the senior angiogram of the final result. I know you guys are probably seeing that disease segment after, but I think we will wait for the discussion on whether need to tackle that part or not. But I'm quite happy with the RCA result. For the second flash itself, I use the same score flash NC balloon, 3.0 times 15 millimeter. But this time I took an AP quarter view. So you can see it gives you much more idea on how far you should go. Of course, when this is very tight lesion. So once I put my balloon, my flow is already impaired. Now I decided maybe I'm just going to dilate from that part, not to extend all the way into the branch. So again, I dilated at nominal pressures at 12 atmosphere as you can see here, all the way to the near proximal segment. And this is the result. Now you can see here, probably there's a staining outside of the vessel. So I would label this as at least type one perforation. Now it could have been a bad dissection, but you can see that that staining extends beyond what I believe is the vessel architecture. But nevertheless, patient is stable. I don't think that uh, the, uh, the perforation goes into a cavity. So I think that thing can be dealt with uh, very safely. At that point of time, I don't have a 3.0 millimeter stand anymore. So I have to use a 2.75 stand 28 millimeter. As you can see, there is the placement of my stand. Now I have to deploy at the higher atmosphere at 20 and post dilate with a 3.0 millimeter balloon at the point that I've shown on the right hand side. I will show the end result later. Uh, because of time, I think I'll quickly move to the LED. So this is the short time to find the length of the LED. So as you can see, it's probably about 30 millimeters. Again, nominal pressures of the scoring balloon. Of course, the LED could have been treated by a drug coated balloon. But I think after periodization, there is significant dissection on the vessel. So I was thinking maybe a quick finish with a stand should have done the trick. So it's a 2.75 and 32 millimeter at 14 atmosphere because to accommodate the distal vessel, which I think is a bit smaller than my 3.0 millimeter balloon. And after post dilatation, again, with a 3.0 times 15 millimeter at the high pressures, especially proximally, this is the final result of the LED. As you can see, the flow into the diagonal is much more faster than before. And this is the view from the IO cleaner view. Okay, so I'll just show the circumflex. So this is the final shot of the circumflex. Again, the result looks good. I probably did not extend too much proximally, but uh, I guess this is good enough because I went a bit high pressure on the proximal part. So there was some concern in I stand metal position, but I guess uh, I have expanded the stand well up to two. I don't think I want to go further higher because remember, we probably had the curie perforation earlier. So I think higher pressures might possibly tear the vessel apart. So I think that is the whole case. Uh, after one day of hospitalization, he was well. The toponic eye came down and he was in my clinic one week later and he was very well. A standard medication given on discharge, do any better bottom pump inhibitor and your ARB and uh, beta blocker as well, plus 13. So just some take home messages. Uh, I think you come from PC is a percentage stand for complex PCI. And remember for the second place, I did deploy high pressures. It was, uh, it tolerated the, and it was deploying very well. I guess in this kind of vessel, when you don't have intravascular imaging, you probably need careful judgment in dealing with uh, the vessel sizing or sizing of your stand. And sometimes that takes a bit of uh, art rather than a particular uh, skill that you need. And you know, when you have some vessel perforation, if it's at least one, I think you can be calm when dealing with the vessel perforation. And uh, that I would like to thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wan Faisal. I think that was a uh, good case, uh, triple SL PTCA. A uh, couple of things. I think uh, point number one I want to say is um, I, I wouldn't routine, do you routinely use a, a scoring balloon to pre dilate? And that to almost have one is to one. Uh, I would have straight gone for a probably just a non compliant balloon 
maybe a 2.5 to dilate all the lesions because um, certainly for the circumflex that looked big uh for me uh, i think it's a personal preference uh, many people will use a semi compliant because it doesn't look classified you can also use an nc uh, you can also use a score i think after a while i think that takes uh, uh, i mean it depends on the, the reason why i kind of use scoring was i think the lesion is a bit more fibrotic uh, because uh, he's a non diabetic so i think probably a fibrotic lesion will be more predominant in this case and then the calcified, but also not so li much lipid laden. So I was thinking something fibrotic uh, scoring might do a bit better. But I guess if you have used uh, uh, NC blown, I think it's also okay. Right. Because in the end, uh, what what is your treatment? If I, I do plan up front to stand all the vessels rather than use dark coated balloon. So I think if uh, to stand, I think any balloon will be okay. But if you want to use a dark coated balloon, probably scoring will be a bit better. Yeah. Right. And regarding the RCI, I think what you did is absolutely fine. When you have lots of ectatic segments, you don't want to put a long stent and have multiple areas of malopposition, especially when you don't have an IVUS. So just do a spot stenting is absolutely fine. And the third point is regarding whether it's a dissection or a perforation, debatable. I mean, it's just a type 1, 99.9% .9 of the time, those heal with just just stenting and post dilatation. Um, over to Ajay yeah. person. And Dr. Carlo, your comments? Yeah, uh, great case. Uh, I agree with uh, the majority of your uh, approach, um, uh, especially in the focal stent in the, in the right. I agree with this uh, strategy in order to prevent long stent in the right. Uh, I was not afraid about the perforation. Actually, to me, it was more likely a good dissection of the, the lesion on the steps due to the scoring balloon, not clearly uh, uh, perforation. My only comment is on the LAD uh, from the Anjo, uh, the stenosis uh, was to me intermediate, uh, was not so uh, really a critical lesion. So I pre pre uh, personally would, uh, would not treat uh, or leave this on medical therapy and look at the follow up the patient. So I personally would, I would treat it only the right and the self, and uh, I personally I leave the LAD on medical therapy. But congratulations for this thing. Any yep. uh, comments? Thank you for the panel? comment. Yes, Dr. Siddiqui. Yeah, uh, you see the case looks fine because you know this is a multivascular disease and ideally cabbage is a better option but as already discussed where the patient refused cabbage so they went for a multivessel PCI. But I think when you have a puff at the level of uh, stenting uh, during uh, uh, circumflex, uh, I would have stopped there and should uh, go for LED stenting uh, as a stage after that. So uh, doing at the same time when you have a puff and you are doing a multi-vessel PCI and you're stenting all three vessels together, I think uh, one should stop when you have a puff over, uh, at the time of circumflex and should ask the patient to come again for uh, if it remains stable for the LED PCI later. That would actually be. Otherwise, the case looks good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, Dr. Fensel. I think we can go on to the uh, next case. Um, Next presenter is uh, Dr. Ali Tohani, he's a lecturer, Department of Cardiology from Egypt. He has got experience with uh, angiography, PCIs, and structural heart disease as well. Over to you, Dr. Ali. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for uh, the kind invitation. Do you see my slides now? Yes, you can go to full screen, sir. Okay. Yes, that's fine. Okay, uh, thanks for the kind invitation. Uh, now I begin uh, uh, my presentation uh, by uh, taking like a snapshot for using Yokin stent in multiple clinical scenarios. And let's begin with case one. It's 50, 55 years old female. She's diabetic, dyslipidemic. She has a crescendo angina in the last uh, two months. 
and uh, she has a higher risk criteria in stress ECG. Her uh, coronary angiography showed the CX was okay. It's like a codominant system, and the LAD uh, has like a CTO with uh, uh, ambiguous uh, 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 cap and also ambiguous course. So uh, for this reason, we went for uh, bilateral injection to uh, reveal ambiguity of the LAD course and also uh, for uh, a proximal cap identification. As you can see now, it's uh, easy CTO, it's GCTO scored like uh, zero or one. So uh, we uh, used a PT2 uh, moderate support uh, 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 wire and we passed it into the CTO segment. And then uh, we uh, pre-dilated with a balloon two, uh, two by 20 uh, millimeter. And then stenting by open a 3.5 by 40. Uh, millimeter and then post dilatation and uh, uh, with uh, good uh, final uh, results. Case two, it's about 62 years old female. She's diabetic, uh, has a rheumatoid arthritis presented with non ST elevation myocardial infarction. Is uh, her coronary angiography, as you can appreciate. As a like a, a subtotal osteal LED, and the plaque also extends into uh, the uh, distal lift main, and she has also a totally occluded uh, lift circumflex. But the LED should be her uh, culprit for non-ST elevation. So we wired both uh, LED and uh, LCX, and then we pre-dilated. Uh, and then stenting by you can stent uh, the four by 32 millimeter and then post dilatation and stent optimization and also final pot with 4.5 by 15 NC balloon. With uh, good uh, final uh, results. He's three, about uh, 70 years old male. He's, he's diabetic, hypertensive, smoker, this epidemic presents with inferior STEMI. His coronary angiography shows a total thrombotic uh, proximal to mid segment uh, uh, right coronary artery. We wired this uh, RCA and then pre dilatation and then stenting by uh, U.3.0 uh, by 32 and 4.0. Uh, stents with stent optimization and post dilatation, and this is the final result. And finally, uh, 60 years old male hypertensive smoker, this epidemic, he has a new onset angina refractory to medical treatment, has to LED uh, diagonal PCI using TAT technique three years ago, a stress MPI large perfusion defect in the LED territory. His coronary angiography, as you can see, there is an LED diagonal uh, bifurcation stenting using a tab, which was uh, written in the uh, old report. And you can appreciate here, there is uh, some uh, late luminal loss in the diagonal as well as in the LED, but not that significant. But in specific views, we can appreciate there is LED uh, uh, critical lesions that are in the uh, in the ostium or in the ostium of the LED, as well as in the uh, cranial views and uh, in the extreme right uh, uh, cranial view, right of the cranial view, as you can see here. Uh, unfortunately, we, we didn't have the IVAS in this uh, to know the uh, the exact mechanism of the uh, instant stenosis, but uh, we can appreciate in the uh, uh, in this uh, stent in the LED is 3 uh, stent, which I think it smell, uh, it's an undersized stent for uh, a gentleman. So uh, we now have a, a failure of uh, tap technique, so uh, we cannot uh, uh, wire the exact uh, new carina. So we uh, adopted strategy of uh, crushing uh, this uh, uh, open the LED stents and the crush the diagonal. So that's what we did. And then we uh, put LED stent 4.0 by 12. 
and then we rewired and did uh, a, a, a final casing uh, and uh, this is the final this is the final uh, result so my take home message in in patients when with uh, ischemia undergoing primary angioplasty the usage of uh, the eucalyptus stents has excellent angiographic results in CTO, the suitable stent catheter designed with an integrated kinking protection, the flexible tip ensure perfect crossability and trackability. And also in left main and bifurcation intervention, the white silk circumference design and only two connector struts allow perfect side branch access, which is essential for bifurcation stenting. And thank you so much. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Ali. I think you just demonstrated all the different facets of the Yukon stent. Uh, like you said, I think the trackability and deliverability is one of the best among the stents that are available. Uh, at least in India, it's it's the Yukon stents are in what we call the basic, uh, you know, the government scheme kind of stents, which are available for a lower cost compared to the premium stents like Expedition or Onyx or uh, Synergy, which are the much higher rate. So even for a stent, which is given at a lower cost in our country, I think it's got excellent trackability. I think the only only thing that we need to keep, we use a lot of Yukon choice here. Um, the only thing that we need to keep in mind is that the distance from the balloon market to the stent is one mm. Usually it's 0.5 on either side, normally for all the stents, but for Yukon choice, it's one mm. So if you take a stent, which is 18 mm, uh, the, the balloon actually is actually 20 mm, one mm plus one mm on either side. So, so when you have a precise austere landing, you need to keep that in mind. Uh, that that's the only thing. Uh, I have a question uh, because I don't. I personally don't know very well the Yukon stent. Uh, in case of bifurcation, you need to do a pot. Um, uh, I, I, my, my question is, how can you uh, oversize the stent? Uh, I mean, uh, it's uh, low to go up to one millimeter uh, up, like uh, the 3O up to 4O, or, uh, or it's too much. So you need to be lower, like 0 0.5 or 0 0.75, because I don't know this, this stent very, very much. I think the expansion limits are the usual 1 mm. Expansion limit is there. It, it doesn't have the wide flexibility such as an Onyx or a Synergy or an Ultimaster, but uh, I think 1 mm is what standardly is what is accepted. Okay, so it's a, so this is a good stand for performing by protection because uh, in general the port need to be at least 0 0.5, 1 millimeter up on the stand side. So thank you. Any comments from the panel? Regarding left man, that is osteal uh, was handled, no? it was left man to LED standing was there. So there probably I would have uh, optimized the result with IVAS. And uh, I would like to know what was the um, diameter of the stent used or post dilatation port? What was the diameter of the balloon there? Because in, in our cases, when we do left man here, uh, the average diameter is you know 5.5 to 6 millimeter, and in that scenario you can doesn't fit. You know then we have to use sky point and the other uh, newer stents. Uh, so the expansion limit will be less here. Okay, we we were thinking about uh, to cross over by left main LED, but uh, we didn't want to make it more complex. Especially the CX was okay, and uh, no, not was, this case. The earlier case, earlier case, OLED, LED still you did, so you went up till left main, right? So there, uh, you know, I angiographically it looks like a little bit mismatch. But then probably IVAS would have been better for the optimization. Yeah, yeah sure. Yes. Also, IVAS is mandatory for uh, for for knowing the exact mechanism of uh, instant stenosis. Also, the other case was fine. Like you crushed the you know neocarina and did a so the, that is actually recommended for bifurcation. That is good. Uh, Dr. Ali uh, Hamad from Malaysia. 
just want to ask again your case of the CTO that the after you cross with the balloon uh, with the wire you can go straight with the 2o balloon not not 1.5 and then the, what is the highest uh, balloon before you deploy the stand the the the, the high the, the highest uh, size of balloon the size was uh, 2 by 20 uh, regular right. balloon uh, uh, and then your stand is 3.5 yeah Okay, so because uh, that's a big size. Because uh, usually, what happen uh, in the CTO, uh, I tend to go a little bit low uh, because the CTO, you know, the one point five and then two o two point five. So before you de can deploy safely, uh, three point five. But the result of yours is very good. You you use the Ivers in this case to uh, properly yeah. size the three to three point five. The difficulty in this CTO is like the ambiguity of the course of the LED book because it was like a strange uh, wrapping. So I didn't uh, exactly uh, be sure of the anatomy except by bilateral injection. Uh, but it's not that difficult CTO because if you know what's uh, what's the course of your artery and the very, very short segment, and I think it's not that chronic because the patient has like a crescendo angina in a in a, a short time uh, frame. So it's a uh, very easy uh, uh, crossing. It was not that complex uh, procedure. I think we'll move on to the next case. Uh, Dr. Srikant Shetty is a senior consultant cardiologist from Sakra Hospital in Bangalore, India. Over to you, sir, for your presentation. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's a privilege to uh, address you all. And I'm going to present this uh, case, uh, case of a uh, quadruple challenge. It's a very um, complex uh, anatomical and clinical scenario, which uh, required a complex angioplasty and which helped the patient. So it's a 73 year old gentleman, long-standing diabetes and hypertension. So he was evaluated for stable angina in 2014, and he was found to have a calcific LAD D1 stenosis, and uh, distal LAD was diffusely diseased and total occlusion at the apex. RTA and uh, circumflex did not have significant disease. So, so he was uh, taken up for CAVG at that time at a premier institution, and then the surgeon unfortunately closed the chest because he felt the LAD was too densely calcified to do an endotractin. And uh, since then, he had been doing okay, fortunately. But six months prior to his presentation to us, he was having refractory angina, class three, class four, and unremitting biventricular failure. Also, uh, he had generalized edema and pleural effusion and breathlessness. So he had been seeing various doctors. And because of the pleural effusion, he was, in fact, being evaluated to rule out an infective cause. And when he was admitted with us, he was in uh, CHF, also requiring uh, inotropes, elevated troponin, bilateral pleural effusion, eco showed severe bioventricular dysfunction, pulmonary hypertension, and the left ventricular rejection fraction was uh, 30%. His creatinine on admission was 1.9, and he had been averaging around 1.6 prior to his admission. So that means there already was some acute kidney injury was hypotensive on arrival, so he was started on inotropes and torsimide and irregular uh, ACS protocols with dual antiplatelet and anticoagulation. So over the next four days, uh, we were hoping to stabilize him medically before taking uh, any interventional step because we knew that he had a complex coronary anatomy uh, in, during his prior admission in 2014. So whatever we had to do would be very complex that we were aware of. So we were hoping to optimize his condition. So over the next four days, he was having recurrent rest angina, runs of uh, short runs of polymorphic VT, and he remained on noradrenaline and dopamine. And his creatinine slowly climbed to 2.5 milligram per deciliter. So he was not getting better. Also, so our, what are the challenges? One, he was having refractory ischemia, acute decompensated heart failure, and a cardiorenal syndrome in the background of CKD. And he had been previously deemed unfit for CABG. And obviously, in the last seven years, he would have had progression of coronary disease. 
So should we cat and proceed at the risk of worsening his renal status? And he's currently active failure and inotrope dependent. So it's a high risk for complex intervention. So a true chip situation. Or should we offer him only compassionate care, but the patient clearly wanted to be better? Should we stabilize medically and put AICD? It would be meaningless because unless you treat ischemia, a defibrillator wouldn't help the patient live longer. And so we explained the situation to the patient and the family and performed angiogram with minimal contrast. So this was his angiography. So as you can see, his LED diagonal disease had progressed. The diagonal had become a CTO. LED pretty much remained the same. Coronary distal right coronary PDA, PLU are feeling retrogradely. So there has been significant progression of his uh, coronary disease. In the cranial view, the, the diagonal has become a CTO. Uh, LED distal total occlusion, dense calcium everywhere. So, so the first thing we did was to uh, take the opinion of the surgeon. And again, the surgeon also said, can't operate. Uh, this is RCA. This gave us some hope because you could see that it was a short segment total occlusion with a micro channel that was seen over there. So we had some hope of uh, doing a quick angioplasty over here. So complex clinical anatomical subset, dense calcium, two CTOs, renal dysfunction, severe bioventricular dysfunction, and acute decomposition heart failure. Now, he was rejected for CAPG, obviously, because of very high risk. So the plan, um, because at that time, we didn't have an impella certification for our unit. So we had to do an IABP supported. IVL and uh, rota assisted multivessel PCI and uh, to achieve all this with the minimal contrast. So we put in a temporary pacer and a balloon pump. Uh, we started with the right coronary because uh, it was the receiving vessel for the collaterals and not the donor. So we thought we were less likely to make him unstable during the procedure. So the lesion could be crossed quickly as expected with the field XT with the support of a, a microcatheter. Microcatheter could not be advanced below beyond the occlusion. However, we managed to take smaller balloons and then upside and try to advance the uh, IOS, but it wouldn't go through. So you can see there is concentric calcification with nodularity. So we again used bigger balloons and then finally, again, the IOS wouldn't go through. Then we took a um, IVL balloon, three millimeter, and uh, then we deployed a stent. All these we were doing without injecting much uh, contrast. So two stents in the right coronary artery and post dilatation. And this was the result I got in the right coronary. You can see that the PDA ostium is a total occlusion. There is some disease in the PLV ostium also. But the aim was to make the patient stable and not make the angioplasty more complex, so we did not run after the uh, PDA-PLV bifurcation. And then I proceeded to the left side, so starting with the uh, circumflex artery, a slightly more difficult lesion to cross, but again, crossed with the fielder XT with the support of a microcatheter. And sequential balloon dilatations and uh, Wolverine cutting balloon, and then took a, uh, the same IVL balloon three millimeter here. So we got it open and then uh, uh, deployed a, a vivo stent there and post dilated and then went on to the LED. Uh, the proximal part of the LED we could balloon, but this was this turned out to be a balloon uncrossable uh, lesion. So we had to take a rotor wire. Sorry, it looks like my slides are stuck.
So I had to uh, rotor the lesion with a 1.5 millimeter uh, burr and uh, then uh, use the remaining pulses of the. Um, let me just go back to the. Sorry. So then did uh, uh, rotor ablation and then. Uh, uh, IVL, whatever remaining pulses were there with the three millimeter IVL balloon, I used that to treat the lesion there. And then uh, stented, a long stent, post dilated aggressively. Still, there is some uh, lesion at the proximal edge of the stent. So, deployed one more stent over there and post dilated. The fairly reasonable uh, outcome. So the IABP was removed the same evening, subsequent to which he diurest well. The inotropes were weaned off, creatinine reduced to two, and because he had severe LO dysfunction and scars prior to discharge, we, I mean, one might debate this, uh, we implanted an AICD and discharged uh, four days post PCI, and he remained ambulant and heart failure free since then. So in critically ill ischemic patients, uh, revascularization interrupts the vicious cycle and aids recovery. Cardiorenal syndrome Im improves with correction of heart failure and by improving perfusion. So that should not worry us so much while doing complex intervention. Use of hemodynamic support for high-risk PCI is important. And of course, watchful use of contrast is a must. And combining IVL with rota is a great strategy for severely calcific lesions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Srikant. I think that was an uh, extremely challenging case. I think you had multiple challenges in this case. Uh, I mean, high-risk patient, very complex procedure, uh, requiring all the armamentarium that we currently have. And I think the end result was quite satisfactory. Um, I, I don't think I have any comments as such. A great case. Thank you so much. I have, uh, uh, I have uh, uh, some comments from regulation. The great case, this is a real a cheap case, as is a common uh, classification. So, uh, of course, uh, I personally would have utilized the impeller device, but probably it was not available in your hospital. Uh, so, so, this is why you utilize balloon pump. That's right. Yes, yes. We were not certified for uh, Impella use at that time. Yeah, but this is a, a typical case of the Impella uh, CP uh, support. Uh, uh, about the contrast, the, 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 uh, the contrast nephropathy, uh, for sure you stated it's important to limit the contrast volume. So my question is how, how much was the contrast volume injected and what what is, if any, your cut off uh, for these patients. Usually we have uh, the GFR reference. <clears throat> I suppose in this patient GFR should be around 30 <clears throat> because creatinine was two. So, <clears throat> so normally you should not exceed three times GFR. So uh, theoretically the maximum volume in these patients uh, should be uh, 67 milliliters. How was the real contrast maybe volume? So I, I think we've managed to finish this procedure with about 50 ml of contrast. As you see, there were very few injections that I made. In fact, I think I showed pretty much all the injections that were made. Mm -hmm. Even eventually, over the next one year, his creatinine came down to close to one. I, I myself was surprised, you know, once when he came for a follow-up, his creatinine was one, and then I asked him to get it rechecked because I said, this is too good to be true. And uh, of course, considering the uh, diffuse disease, calcific lesion, um, uh, the risk of re and repeat events in the future is uh, quite high. Um, but we were able to salvage him from that acute uh, situation at that point of time. Now it's almost uh, two and a half years since his uh, procedure. He had one uh, re-intervention, but he continues to be ambulant and uh, independent, uh, you know, with uh, uh, good quality of life. 
It was great. And uh, about the prophylaxis of um, contrast nephropathy, in this case, GF uh, ejection fraction was 30. So uh, I, my question is, how was your hydration protocol in these high-risk patients with depressive uh, ejection fraction? Do you utilize the S ventricular ejection fraction, uh, LVDP uh, value to set uh, the hydration rate? So this patient was in a clinical failure. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. So, so this is a patient where you would uh, obviously uh, avoid hydration uh, because you are only going to make him worse. He will uh, aggravate his cardiorenal syndrome uh, if you hydrate. So the, the only way you can prevent uh, contrast nephropathy in a patient like this is to minimize the use of uh, contrast, use uh, ultra low contrast uh, uh, PCI or a zero contrast PCI if possible. Try and use uh, uh, image-guided PCI uh, as much as possible uh, in a patient because he was in failure. Hydration to prevent contrast nephropathy was uh, not a viable uh, strategy. Otherwise, yes, you can use LVDP as a guidance to uh, determine how much uh, fluid you can give, and that that was the uh, protocol of the Posidian uh, trial. Okay. Okay. Last question, why do you implanted the ACD immediately and didn't wait for nine weeks, nine weeks as recommended? Because you did a great revascularization, so maybe the patient had, maybe had improvement in ejection fraction. So why did you not wait for uh, nine, two months and then uh, decide to implant ACD? Yes, yes I, I, I did mention that probably this is a point uh, which would be debated. One is there was uh, the the VT that he was having polymorphic VT during the hospitalization was all ischemia and heart failure related. I agree about that. However, he had extensive uh, scarring, which um, I was not too optimistic would improve much. In fact, his follow up over the next one one and a half years did not show any significant change in his ejection fraction as I had uh, expected. And um, so he continues to be a candidate who would be at high risk of sudden cardiac death despite his revascular. But uh, I agree that that's not the ideal uh, timing to choose uh, whether you would put an ICD or not. You have to wait at least for six weeks and reassess the LV function and uh, uh, then deploy your uh, defibrillator. In this patient, having pulled out uh, from a dire crisis and uh, doing an expensive because uh, these are mostly pay out of pocket patients, uh, having done an expensive revascularization procedure, um, I didn't just want to hazard him to the risk of a sudden cardiac death out of hospital looking at his uh, LV extensive scar. So, so he, this is not our regular strategy. We do not uh, place uh, AICD so early after uh, revascularization. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Shikhan, what's a follow up PF uh, for the patient? Yeah, it has not changed much actually. So, so this is uh, see, this is one thing. Um, despite revascularization, your patient's ejection fraction may not change much, but his clinical improvement happens. Uh, either way, I think ICD would have been warranted down the line anyway. Down the line, yeah, yeah. I know, I know the timing can be debated. Yes, correct. Thank you. I think for want of time, we'll go to the next case. Uh, thank you, Doctor so for the excellent case. Dr. Kurshid Hassan is a consultant in your cardiology. Uh, yes. Apologies for the yes. intrusion. Uh, Dr. Shetty, uh, I think uh, the 10 years slides, uh, the clinical data slides are, are yet to be presented. Mm -hmm. Do you intend to present them now or we can move it uh, towards the end of the session so that we complete the cases first? Sure, sure. I think we can Please complete the suggest. cases, cases oh, okay. first so that yeah. you know, others get an opportunity to present. Yeah. Sure, sure. Thank um, you. Moving on, Dr. Kushit Hassan is an international cardiologist from Karachi, Pakistan. Over to your slide, sir. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, after Dr. Shetty's case, I think my case would be a piece of cake, but uh, I'll present it anyway. Okay, this is a DK crush in uh, LED STEMI. Can you guys hear me? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're, you're heard and slides are visible. You can go to full screen. 
Yeah, can you hear me, Al? Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. So, this is a 57-year-old male who presents with uh, chest pain for three hours, and this was his uh, ECD. So, no doubt about it. Extensive anterior wall STEMI. He was taken to the cath lab straight away, and this uh, was his angiogram. Uh, Dr. Hassan, apologies. Yeah, I was just asking you to do it full screen. Thank you. Yep. No, thank you. So non-dominant right, very severe proximal LED uh, diagonal disease with a very sizable diagonal actually. Uh, at least 2.5 if not more. So what was the concern here? was a sizable diagonal, which was uh, very severely diseased at the ostium and both proximal and distal to this uh, ostium. So all the reasons to be for its occlusion, high risk of occlusion. So it was difficult to wire almost 90 degrees angle. And, uh, but as always, provisional uh, strategy is always better. So what we did was, uh, took a EBU 3.5, six French BMW into the LED, and with some difficulty, scion black into the diagonal. I pre-dilated the ostium of the diagonal as, as well as the LED with the, a 2O balloon at eight to 10 atmosphere. Initial plan was to see uh, uh, how the LED diagonal looked like after the ballooning. So uh, it looked really bad, almost a, a very, uh, immediate recoil. So I decided for a bifurcation stenting uh, at that time. So I stented first the, uh, the stent, uh, the technique that I wanted to use was uh, DK crush. So I took a Yukon PC 2.512, deployed it at uh, the, uh, in the diagonal uh, with a little protrusion into the uh, LED at about 14 atmosphere, pulled my balloon back a little, went up to 16 just to make sure that the ostium was fully uh, inflated. I was not happy with the, uh, with the ostium. So I further post dilated it with the NC 2.75 into eight, uh, up to 18 atmosphere. And uh, then uh, I crushed it uh, with a 3.5. And then this is the first, uh, first case with a 3.5 in the uh, in the LED, non-compliant, 2.75 into nine atmosphere, uh, and, uh, and NC balloon in the diagonal. And uh, after that, I deployed the stent in the uh, LED. And sorry, let me go back a little. So this is LED, stent 3024, uh, UCOM PC, deployed at 12 atmosphere, rewired the diagonal, dilated it, and then the final kissing uh, in the LED and the diagonal. So this is how it uh, looked like. So pretty good result. Unfortunately, uh, ideally I would have done an IVUS in, in this, but uh, IVUS was not available in that cath lab actually. The patient did well. His uh, chest pain completely settled. His uh, ST elevation settled and uh, the LBEF was normal. So this was his ECG immediately after the procedure. He was discharged two days later and has been doing well. So uh, bifurcation stenting for the right reasons, uh, STEMIs are not excluded usually from this uh, bifurcation trials. And in the DK crash trial, I could find that uh, 63 patients I had bifurcation lesion with STEMI, and uh, about half of these uh, went for a DK crush stenting and half for a provisional uh, stenting. And uh, the outcome in both these uh, groups was uh, unchanged, actually. So it was a reasonable strategy to involve in, uh, uh, in STEMI. The success rate and the uh, outcome was the same in both the groups. So usually, uh, uh, in STEMIs, we tend to put as little metal as possible, but at the same time, we have to provide the best possible solution 
for good outcomes. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Kurshid. I think uh, the last slide is exactly what we try doing in a STEMI situation. Lesser yeah. the metal, the, the better the outcomes usually. Uh, yeah. But I suppose your case was a ideal scenario where it was actually almost a one 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 lesion with a very good size diagonal, almost 275. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah exactly. And, and the fact that you had recoiling after ballooning didn't leave you with much of choice. Yeah, so exactly. it had to be done. And it's, I think the strategy was one of the best strategies available, done in a very meticulous and stepwise fashion. Um, uh, congratulations, thank you. And it was a good case. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Carlo? Yes, yes. Uh, great case. I agree uh, with the, the concept that in uh, STEMI and in general in bifurcation, we should go with provision as much as possible. But in this case, also, I agree with the two stand approach. And uh, DK crash is a good solution. So, uh, great case. Congratulations. Anyone comment from the panel? Uh, the one thing is the timing of this uh, total procedure. Uh, when I look at it, it's, it's very time consuming if you want to do a decay crash in maybe in the not the experienced hands of the operators. So I think uh, you did the excellent one, but uh, if you ask me to give uh, how I do it, maybe I do provisional stenting and see how uh, the, the, the side branch, uh, but the <coughs> wire protection is there. So maybe the TAP is the other choice of, to complete the uh, procedure after the provisional stenting. But anyway, it's very excellent. Good case. Thank you. Thank you. This result is excellent, um, but I would have gone in a different way. Same thing like provisional layered provisional approach. I have never done decay crash in STEMI situation, but then this is a wonderful result. It is time taking. Uh, today also we did one, but it is all well, elective cases we are doing. And we use definition criteria for you know complexity. If the bifurcation is complex one, like size branch length is more and you know more angle, thrombus and all, then probably we start with side branch. Otherwise, most of the time we go provisional and then bail out in a, a Q lot or TAF or provisional T fashion, but it is a wonderful result. Yeah, thank you. I think this was my first case uh, of DK crash in a STEMI actually. You did so very well. Never be, I, I totally agree. Less metal you put in in a STEMI, the better it is. But sometimes you don't have a choice actually. Yeah. Anyway, at the end, the result matters. You know, we have been debating one stand, two stand since long actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Final result is more Initial important. Plan was always the first. One Thank you, Dr. Kushi, for the excellent case. Moving on to Thank our you. last uh, case discussion uh, by Dr. An uh, Dr. Antonio. He's an international cardiologist from uh, Italy. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you to Transroom. Speaking uh, from Giuseppe Bonita. This is country manager at Transrumina, Italy. So uh, thanks uh, to Giuseppe for the hospitality. Mm -hmm. My case, um, uh, complex uh, bifurcation stenting in, uh, in a patient with uh, multivessel coronary and the uh, um, his presentation uh, is a 61 year old male uh, smoker with uh, heart epidemia, and uh, he was admitted to the vast uh, yes, uh, carotid, uh, carotid artery disease with uh, right uh, internal carotid uh, 70% and uh, left uh, stenosis of uh, 70%. So uh, I was admitted uh, for uh, carotid uh, and arterectomy. Um, uh, he has uh, blood pressure of uh, 140 and uh, 60. Um, the medical therapy uh, is um, uh, aspirin uh, um, and uh, atorvastatin uh, 10 milligrams and uh, perindopil 10 milligrams. Lab test uh, showed the total cholesterol uh, 211 uh, and the LDL cholesterol uh, 100. Uh, um, 41, so uh, above the um, uh, limit considered for this uh, risk patient. Uh, 
DCG was normal, uh, sinus rhythm uh, 65 uh, ppm, uh, echo also was normal, ejection fraction of uh, 65%. And um, um, uh, before the surgery, uh, cardiovascular assessment uh, um, concluded that uh, in, reason for the, in reason of the high risk uh, profile, uh, it was decided to perform uh, coronary angiography uh, before uh, surgery. And this is the angiography, and uh, you can uh, see in the LAD, uh, in the proximal part, and also in the mid part, uh, uh, proximal part, the marginal uh, branch. In the uh, LAD with a long uh, disease, uh, and also a bifurcation with a diagonal uh, branch. Dina bifurcation one one one. The spider uh, the is on the uh, obtuse uh, mark proximal part. Uh, we uh, decided to PI and uh, we have a potential um, uh, like normalization uh, at index or uh, staged. Uh, um, and uh, another uh, lesion uh, involving however and uh, single stent or uh, two stent and in case of two stents uh, technique okay. so uh, our uh, planning uh, format first uh, um, bifurcation treatment of uh, um, the LED uh, first diagonal with two stent and with uh, the DK crash uh, technique and then in second stage uh, to perform uh, the treatment of obtus marginal uh, branch with a single stent uh, placed in the osteola proximal uh, tract of the um, uh, this branch. So this is uh, the uh, first uh, treatment in the first diagonal branch. Uh, um, I inflated the balloon merge uh, two per uh, twelve uh, millimeters. And then uh, I uh, pre-treat the, the LED with uh, balloon uh, 2.75 per 20 millimeters. And then uh, I placed uh, uh, under the bifurcation um, uh, drug resistant Vivo ISA 2.75 per uh, 28 uh, millimeters and the mid tract of the LED. And uh, with DK crash. Uh, uh, stand in the uh, branch with an uncle. I inflated the uh, vivo uh, two point first, like, and then uh, uh, crashed the uh, D1 balloon uh, two point seventy millimeters. This is the video showing. Branch rewiring, no problem to cross the uh, crushed uh, struts in the first diagonal branch uh, with uh, Vivo ISAR in this uh, ramus. Then the first kissing uh, balloon. Then uh, a proximal LED stenting. Uh, um, in overlapping with the stent in the mid tract with uh, Vivo ISAR uh, 3 uh, per uh, 24 uh, millimeters in the um, proximal part of LED. Then pot uh, with non copian balloon 3 uh, per uh, 15 millimeters. And then a final kissing balloon with uh, non copian balloon 3 per 15 in LED and a non copian balloon 2.5 per 15 millimeters in first diagonal branch. And then the report with an accompanying balloon 3.25 per 12 millimeters in the first tract in the proximal part of the first stent in LAD at 18 atmosphere. This is the final result on LAD first diagonal branch. And after uh, I decided to treat um, uh, placing a uh, stand 2.5. Millimeters with a drawback uh, technique with a circumflex artery uh, drawing at the stent um, up to marginal step back. But uh, we can observe 
practice in the uh, part of the uh, under the ostium uh, of the uh, branch. So I decided to place uh, vivo per 18 millimeters in the mid part of the circumflex and then I was with uh, non copy in uh, circumflex and uh, an uncoupled 75 per two uh, marginal branch with uh, three point per 18 millimeters in the first tract of the uh, circumflex uh, um, stand. This is the final result, the good result in uh, both the uh, back location also in this uh, view. So the medical therapy uh, is uh, aspirin, uh, dual antiprotic uh, therapy aspirin uh, plus clopidogrel, uh, because uh, I placed the five deaths uh, in, uh, but the patient was uh, also uh, there is so I uh, uh, described clopidogrel was upgraded because 10 uh, milligrams but this patient uh, the then 50 so um, I prescribed taking rosuvastatin in 20 milligram it's a uh, um, uh, PCS editor uh, evolocumab uh, uh, course road this uh, went to perform uh, after one uh, month, uh, or after three, six months, uh, uh, perform data about uh, the Pfizer, but uh, this is uh, the sign of the secular global legend. Of the label must ready going PCI in the short dual antiprotein therapy in a primary objective weight being allowed from a population abbreviated the doctor and I being risk. So uh, my experience with Vivo uh, is that at uh, some point, uh, like homogeneous experience and trackability also in uh, like this uh, case report, and branch access, so it's good for, uh, it is a good option with uh, inspectors, uh, disease, diabetes, uh, Solution like uh, before, case or doctor's lesson. Thank you for your uh, thank you, Dr. Antonio. I think it was a very good case of uh, double bifurcation again, significant uh, side branch which could not have been ignored in both the case, both the vessels. Uh, good result, Dr. Carlo. Thank you. Well, uh, yes, uh, this is a complex case. Um, I have uh, uh, one major uh, concern because I don't understand why the patient had a really coronary angiography. The patient was uh, um, asymptomatic. I didn't understand. I don't know if there was some uh, non-invasive test of ischemia. So why you did the coronary angiography? There is yes, no he was decided uh, before. Uh... He, he had the cardiovascular assessment uh, forced the indication. Uh, probably um, um, it was bad, but uh, in uh, profile, um, uh, we decided to um, abbreviate the strategy uh, before surgery. It was. Um, uh, to uh, to coronary angiography, but uh, however, better to perform for, uh, this. But however, this case uh, showed that uh, patient with peripheral artery disease have uh, uh, an high probability to have also coronary artery disease. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Antonio. Thank you, Dr. Carlo. Thank you, Dr. Antonio.
So in, uh, I worked also in another, in another institution in which uh, every time that uh, we um, uh, we have patients with uh, that have uh, to go to vascular surgery. In every time, uh, these patients uh, have to be um, subjected. Not in my but, actual um, work of uh, working but, place. But uh, I mean, but I, I don't understand. The patient was uh, uh, in the hospital to perform endoplasty. So I believe there was some reason, uh, some indication at least uh, to to have this because the patient was in the hospital for one reason, and uh, due to coronary angiography, everything was completely changed. Why you decide to do first stenting? Uh, I mean, the indication for endarectomy, endarectomy was real or was just hypothetical? First, the second... No, it was, it was real, it was real. And, uh, and why you, you do uh, first endarectomy? Because the patient was asymptomatic, no ischemia, at least, I don't know, and uh, why you do angioplasty, coronary angioplasty first, and then postpone one uh, clinical driven uh, uh, intervention? Because I believe there was some clinical decision to perform and that direct. Uh, because uh, before uh, he performed an ambulatory in which uh, was uh, find this. Uh, Stenosis in the carotid, and um, um, in the clinical evaluation before the start was decided by to uh, perform um, uh, uh, coronary angiography. Um, the patient um, hasn't uh, uh, over ischemia, uh, however. Uh, to, to uh, you are right that it's uh, better to perform ischemia testing in this patient. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Antonio. I think um, uh, because of the time delay, we'll uh, uh, is Dr. Shrikan doing the last part on the 10 year follow up? If we have time, it's just a brief presentation, otherwise, we can. <laughs> Yeah, we can, uh, like, yeah, maybe we can just quickly we press have it. it. Yeah. yeah. Because we finished most of the discussion otherwise. Fine. All right. So we all know the uh, challenges of uh, the uh, uh, polymer uh, in uh, drug coated stents, particularly in uh, diabetic patients who are more thrombogenic and also who have a more uh, a robust inflammatory response to the polymer uh, within the uh, blood vessel. So this is all old data, um, which uh, lays down the premise for uh, seeking uh, non-polymer coated uh, stents and uh, how uh, this has evolved over uh, time. And uh, VOSR is interesting because it uses probocol as a matrix binder to hold uh, serolimus, which is the active drug, but probocol itself has been shown to have some antioxidant and uh, anti-proliferative properties, which uh, uh, also uh, adds to the um, anti-retinosis uh, effects. And uh, uh, this, the the drug release um, uh, kinetics of um, the uh, uh, VOSR. Uh, is uh, somewhat uh, comparable to the permanent uh, polymer-based uh, drug quarter stents. And faster drug release uh, compromises the uh, DES ability to prevent smooth cell proliferation for a complete four weeks, and hence there is increased chance of restenosis. So as compared to conventional polymer-free stents, dual drug polymer-free stent, that is uh, VOSR, has drug release kinetics which are more uh, favorable. So there is a prolonged re release of serolimus, uh, in, which is 80% in uh, 28, 28 days. And it has been shown in preclinical trials that uh, serolimus and probocol are released in about four to six uh, weeks. So uh, 
uh, like Dr. Antonio pointed out in his presentation, so the strength itself has uh, several uh, advantages. It has got a microporous uh, surface which uh, controls the release of kinetics of the drug, and it has got a good um, crossing profile. And uh, even in our own uh, experience of using almost uh, 300 stents in different uh, complex scenarios as well, uh, there is good uh, deliverability of this uh, stent. And uh, the abluminal coating leads to faster endothelialization of the uh, stent. And there is a hybrid design of the stent struts, which leads to maximum side branch access and uh, low str strut thickness, uh, optimizing the radial strength. So these are the uh, technical uh, specifications. So over the last 10 years, several trials have been done with this platform, which have been published in uh, prestigious uh, journals right from 2004 uh, onwards, uh, which the, the 2004 study in the CCI showing that microporous surface was found to be equally safe as compared to electropolis surface. 2008 uh, preclinical study uh, of VOSR demonstrating drug release uh, kinetics. 2010, uh, the JAK uh, study uh, showed that uh, uh, VOSR demonstrated 33% reduction in binary restenosis as compared to uh, endeavor sprint and 25% reduction in comparison to cipher. And then at, in 2016, the five year uh, follow up of uh, VOSR uh, trial uh, showed similar rates of definite or probable stent thrombosis as the zotrolimus eluting stent, permanent polymer stent. And uh, VOSR compared with the uh, zotrolimus eluting stent was similar in the subgroup of uh, diabetes as well. And 2017, at uh, five years, uh, VOSR uh, compared to durable polymer ZDS uh, uh, stent was similar in subgroup of STEMI. And the 2019 ESR test PI, which is a long term analysis of uh, 10 years, showed similar efficacy and safety profile as a resolute integrity. And in uh, diabetic patients, uh, 10 year follow up showed uh, notably low rates of. Uh, target vessel related myocardial infarction and low rates of definite stent thrombosis. So this, this is the uh, composite endpoint of cardiac death, the target vessel related uh, myocardial infarction or TLR and secondary endpoints where patient oriented composite endpoint of all cause death, any myocardial infarction or any reverse relation and definite or probable stent thrombosis. And in comparison with uh, uh, the zotrolimus saluting stent, uh, VOSR showed low stent thrombosis rate of 1.6% at 10 years. And uh, in the diabetics, the 10 year follow up uh, showed that uh, the all cause death, cardiac death, any reverse relation, TLR or target vessel related myocardial infarction were favorable in comparison with the uh, resolute integrity. And uh, VOSR uh, shows numerically low rates of uh, MACE and all cause mortality at 10 years in the diabetic patients. And very low rates of uh, target vessel related uh, myocardial infarction at uh, uh, 10 years. So, so it's a stent with robust 10 year uh, data in uh, diabetic subset. And uh, it is the study conducted against uh, FDA approved ZDS uh, stents. And it uh, demonstrated low rates of uh, stent thrombosis and uh, uh, low rates of target vessel related myocardial infarction and numerically low rates of uh, MACE and all pass uh, mortality. So this is a stent that is well suited for treatment of coronary disease in uh, diabetic patients. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Srikant. I think no comments. I think we can uh, conclude. Uh, yes, sir. So uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for uh, joining in. Thank you, Dr. Lijo, for the seamless moderation. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Brigori, for chairing the session. Thank you, the entire expert panel. 
and the speakers for sharing such uh, immense knowledge with us and your uh, complex case PCI experiences. Uh, I'm sure all of us had a lot of learning today uh, from each other. Uh, Ajay, do you have any uh, final comments to make or shall we conclude? Uh, Shil, thank you very much for everybody, uh, you know, for joining for this event and, you know, not, no more comments from my side. The presentations were excellent and uh, overall the session was quite uh, interesting for everybody. Right. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lejo. We can conclude now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sheel and Ajay, for the uh, opportunity given for all of us. Uh, it was very good. Uh, variety of very good uh, variety of cases that we had uh, from all the uh, presenters and a good discussion. And good to know that uh, you know it was multinational faculty all involved sort of agreed in uh, all the steps and all the strategies that we discussed. And that's encouraging and that's, that's good to know. Thank you. Right. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.